Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step deployment procedure of vCenter Server Appliance VCSA 6.0 Update 2. vCenter Server Appliance is a secure, hardened SUSE Linux operating system packaged with vCenter Server vCenter Server Appliance, it contains all of the necessary services for running vCenter Server 6.0. And it is an alternative for Windows-based vCenter Server, and it supports all the features that a Windows-based vCenter supports. It helps you to quickly deploy the vCenter Server without spending time to prepare a Windows operating system for vCenter Server installation. Okay, now here is the table that shows the different sizes of the appliance which can be easily adjusted during the deployment process. So with vSphere 6.0, we have a deployment sizes such as tiny, small, medium, large. For a tiny deployment of vCSA, you just require two vCPUs and eight gig of RAM. It can support a maximum of 20 hosts and 400 VMs. A small deployment of vCenter server requires 4 vCPUs, 16 gig of RAM and it can support up to 150 hosts and 3000 VMs. And a medium deployment requires 8 vCPUs, 24 gig of RAM and it can support up to 300 hosts and 6000 VMs. And a large deployment of uh, vCenter server requires 16 vCPUs, 32 gig of RAM, and it can support 1000 hosts and 10,000 VMs. So with vSphere 6.0, vCenter Server Appliance now has the same minimums and maximums as the Windows installed version of vCenter Server. Here are some of the prerequisites that needs to be taken care of before you deploy a vCenter Server Appliance. So you need a Windows operating system. It can be a desktop or a laptop or a jump box and it should have a compatible browser such as Chrome, Firefox or IE. And the operating system should also have VMware Client Integration Plugin 6.0 installed. Now VMware Client Integration Plugin is required to do the deployment of VCSA from an ISO file. And of course you need to download the VCSA appliance which is the ISO file from VMware website. Now VCSA 6.0 is no longer available as an OVF file so you need to download the ISO file and use the VMware client integration plugin. You need to ensure that the DNS records are created both for the forward and reverse lookup zones for the vCSA deployment for your vCenter server appliance. Now for the deployment purpose of vCSA 6.0, you need to have a standard switch port group that will be used to connect your vCenter server appliance. And the DV switch port group is not supported for the deployment purpose. And for the more details about hardware requirements, uh, I would recommend that you look at the VMware KB article KB2106572, which has more information about the deployment and prerequisites of vCenter Server Appliance 6.0. All right, now let's look at a demo on how to install vCenter Server Appliance 6.0 Update 2. All right, the first thing is you need to download the VMware VCSA 6.0 update 2, which I've already done. And next thing is you need to mount the downloaded ISO file. And before starting the VCSA deployment, VMware client integration plugin must be installed. It can be found in the VCSA directory of the ISO file. It is a simple setup and straightforward installation with couple of next buttons and a finish button. All right, in my case, uh, I've already installed the VMware client integration plugin. So now I'm gonna jump into the root directory of the ISO file and I'm gonna double click on the HTML file called VCSA setup. All right, so this site will now detect the VMware client integration plugin. Once found, it will prompt you to allow the access to the operating system. I'm gonna click allow. 
Here is the welcome screen for vCenter Server Appliance 6.0. So you can either click on install or upgrade. So in this video, since we are installing a new instance of vCenter Server Appliance, so I'm going to click on install. Now check the option that says I accept the terms of the license agreement and click next. Now here you need to type in the uh, IP address or FQDN of your ESXi host or the vCenter server on which you want to deploy the vCenter server appliance. So in my case, uh, this is my first instance of uh, vCenter server. So I'm going to specify the IP address of an ESXi host on which I'm going to deploy the vCenter server appliance. So it is 192.168.11.11. So here is the ESXi host on which I'm going to deploy the vCenter server appliance. So back to the wizard, I'm going to specify the root credentials for my ESXi host. I'm going to click next. So I'm going to click yes on the certificate warning. Okay, I'm going to specify an appliance name. So this will be the name that will show up in the inventory for the vCenter server. So my vCenter server appliance name is vCenter02. And then I'm going to specify the password for the appliance. The username by default is root. I'm going to click next. Now the next screen shows the different deployment options. In case if you are deploying your vCenter server appliance in a large infrastructure with more than one site, you'll probably choose a separate platform services controller. For a smaller setup or for a lab environment, you can select install vCenter server with embedded platform services controller and you can click next. Now VMware has introduced a new feature called platform services controller starting from vSphere 6.0. It offers shared services such as single sign-on, licensing, and certificate management. And it is a mandatory to have at least one platform services controller in your vSphere 6.0 environment. And the platform services controller can be deployed as an internal, which is embedded with vCenter server. The other deployment method is external platform services controller and it has two options. The first one is install platform services controller which will only deploy platform services controller on an appliance. And the next option is install vCenter server which will deploy only vCenter services on the appliance during the deployment. And then you'll need to point your vCenter server appliance to an existing platform services controller. So in my case, I'm going to install vCenter server with an embedded platform services controller. So I'm going to click next. In the next screen, you need to set up the single sign-on. Uh, if you have an existing SSO domain in an existing vCenter 6 platform services controller, you can click this option. You can specify the platform services controller, IP address, the SSO username, password, and port number. But in my case, uh, this is my first vCenter server instance and my first SSO domain that, that will be created. So I'm going to click on create a new SSO domain. And now I need to specify the password for my default vCenter SSO username, which is administrator. So let me specify the password. Now I need to specify the SSO domain name. Uh, your SSO domain name must be unique. Uh, it should not be same as your active directory domain name. So I'm going to type the default domain name, which is vSphere.local. Next thing is SSO site name. So I'm going to specify a site name. I'm going to click next. Now you need to specify the appliance size based on your inventory size of your vCenter server. 
So in my case, I will select tiny, which is up to 10 hosts and 100 VMs. So I'm going to click next. In the select data store screen, you need to select a data store to store the virtual machine files. In my case, the host on which I'm going to deploy the VCSA does not have any shared storage, but only a local default data store. So if the host is connected to an iSCSI, NFS or FC storage, you would see those shared data stores in this screen but I only have one data store so I'm going to select that data store now by default the virtual disks for this virtual machine will be thick disks but you have an option to enable thin disk mode in the same screen so I'm going to select enable thin disk mode and I'll click next in the configured database screen you have two options the first option is to use an embedded database which will use postgres sql database or you can use external database which will only support oracle database and the embedded database which runs on postgres sql is present in both types of installation either the appliance or the windows based vcenter server so just so you know, starting from vSphere 6.0, SQL Express is not supported. So in my case, it's a lab environment and it's a small setup. So I'm going to use an embedded database and I'll click next. Now in the network settings screen, you need to select a network port group for the virtual machine. In my case, I have a standard switch port group, which is VM network. Like I said in the beginning, if you have a DV switch port group, it will not show up here. So you need to have a standard switch port group, at least at the deployment phase of the vCenter server appliance. So I'm going to select my standard switch port group. You need to specify the IP address family, either IPv4 or IPv6 and the network type either the static or DHCP so I'm going to select static so I'm going to specify an IP address for my vCenter server appliance 192.168.11.6 okay next you need to specify the FQDN of your vCenter server which I've done and the subnet mask 255.255.255.0 255.255.0 .255 255.255.255.0 Next you specify the gateway in my case it is 192.168.11.254 and the DNS server which is 192.168.11.1 and the NTP server is same as my DNS server which is 192.168.11.1 if you don't have an NTP server, you can synchronize your appliance time with ESXi host. And you have an option to enable ASSH uh, if you want to do some troubleshooting with your vCenter server appliance. So I'm going to select this option and I'm going to click next. And if you want to join the VMware customer experience improvement program, you can check this option. So this is just lab environment. So I'm going to uncheck this and I'll click next. Now here you can review your settings. Everything looks good for me, so I'm gonna click finish. Now it will take some time for the deployment to finish and you can see the progress bar that indicates the deployment. You can also monitor the deployment status by opening the VM console of the vCenter server appliance. To do that, I'm going to open up vSphere client and I'll type in the IP address of my ESXi host on which the vCenter server appliance will be deployed and I'll type in the root credentials and I'll click login. And if I expand the host, I can see the new instance of my vCenter server. So I'm going to right click on it and I'll click on open console, which will open the VM console. So here is the status of the deployment that you can monitor. All right, you can see that the vCenter server appliance has successfully installed. All right, and uh, this is how the console looks like. 
After getting the first vCenter server instance up and running, I would recommend that you move your vCenter server which is stored on the local data store to a shared data store to provide the high availability. All right, and you can access your vCenter server using the vSphere web client. And here is the link that you need to click on and, and you need to log in with this user account which is administrator at vSphere.local. So let me click on this and I'll click advanced and I'll click proceed. So here is the login screen of vCenter server using vSphere web client. Let me type in the SSO admin user which I specified during the deployment of vCenter server. All right, I'll click login. Okay, so this is your vCenter server using vSphere web client and if I click on hosts and clusters, You'll not see anything in there because I've not created anything here such as data center or any clusters. Another thing that you have to make sure that you license your vCenter server instance soon after the deployment. Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about is uh, appliance management user interface which is appliance MUI. Now for starting from vCenter server appliance 6.0 update 1, there's a new web interface uh, which allows the administration of the appliance. Now on 6.0 update 2, this UI is called as Appliance Management User Interface. You can access it through the IP. In my case, it is HTTPS 192.168.10.6, which is the IP, colon 5480 is the port number. So let me open that. So in my case, it is 192.168.11.6 colon 5480 is the port number. So here is the login screen and you need to type in the root credentials for the appliance that you have set during the deployment of the appliance. So in my case, it is root and the password, click login. So in the summary screen, you can view the host name and the version of the vCenter server appliance. You can find whether it's a vCenter server with embedded or external PSC. In my case, it's an embedded PSC. You can view the overall health status of vCenter server appliance and health messages. You can create the support bundle for the vCenter server and you can reboot or shut down the vCenter server. You can also see the SSO domain name and the status whether it's running or not. In the access section, you can enable SSH and bash shell by clicking the edit button. And in the networking section, you can specify the host name, primary DNS server, secondary DNS server, IPv4 default gateway or IPv6 default gateway if you have configured IPv6. And you can also see the networking interface, whether it's up or not, and the IP address. And you can also check if the proxy settings is enabled or disabled. Now, if you want to reconfigure any of these properties, you can click the appropriate edit buttons for the hostname, name servers, and gateway for the networking interface and for the proxy settings. In the time section, you can view the time zone and edit the time zone of the vCenter server appliance by clicking edit. Now under time synchronization, you can view the method to sync the time so you can use a NTP host or you can use the ESXi host or you can disable if you want to disable the time synchronization. In my case, I'm using the NTP server and I've specified the domain controller as the time server and you can see the NTP synchronization status and the NTP daemon if it is up and running. And you can also see the current time as well. In the update section, you can view the version details such as vendor name, appliance name, update version and description. You can also check the URL for any available update to the current version. And if you click on settings, you'll get an option to check for updates automatically, which will check for updates automatically. And you can also specify a repository by selecting use default repository, which is selected by default. And it will select the default repository for the updates or you can specify a custom repository by selecting the option use specified repository. Now in the administration screen, 
you can change the root credentials for the appliance you can also specify the password expiry settings for the root credentials such as uh, root password validity in days and an email address to notify password expiry warnings so these are the things that you can configure within the appliance management user interface all right i hope you like this video for more technical videos like this please subscribe to my channel